Welcome everybody to this uh, DDEX webinar, um, which is primarily a CDM standard technical deep dive. We will talk briefly about um, its partner standard, the digital sales report, um, but the main focus is on, on the claim detail message that was uh, published by DDEX, I think in May. Um, my name is Mark Isherwood and I'm part of the DDEX Secretariat um, and our agenda for today is a brief introduction from myself um, followed by uh, an examination by Laurent Lemasson Le from SASEM who is co-chair of the working group who will look at the, uh, the way in which the DSR and CDM standards combine to produce a complete um, data flow with regard to the processing um, of uh, information about royalties in the context of um, uh, DSPs. Uh, and then the other co-chair um, of the working group, uh, Zach Hasanoff from Google YouTube, will talk about the process that we went through in order to get the standards um, completed. And then uh, we turn to the deep dive. So my colleague Niels Rump will uh, provide a, a detailed description of the CDM standards and and some real examples of how it fits together um, so that you can see um, how all the nuts and bolts of the uh, standard work. We then have um, some implementation experiences from two licensors and two licensees. These are primarily about their experience of, of implementing the DSR standard because that is widely implemented, um, but also some hint at um, what they're anticipating their timelines might be with regard to implementing um, the claim detail message, which as I said, is only recently um, published. Um, so that'll give you some indication of how we anticipate um, the, company, the main companies are going to move forward with CDM. Um, and then before the final sort of Q&A opportunity, uh, Niels will talk about how closely um, the DSR and CDM standards are integrated to work very closely together. Um, as I said, there is an opportunity for a Q&A at the end um, of the webinar but please feel free to ask questions as we go along on the chat uh, and we will do our very best to um, answer those as, as, as fully as we can. So as you know, uh, DDEX is a standards development organization, um, primarily operating in the music industry and the way in which we develop our standards to create efficient communication of data throughout the value chain is to focus on three things. The most important is the development of standard formats, that is the order in which the different data elements uh, that need to be communicated are set out in a computer message and how they relate to each other. Uh, we also then um, standardize the choreography, that is the order in which messages flow and, and who, who send what to whom uh, and will provide things like triggers for when a message should be sent. And then finally we define the protocols by which the messages themselves actually get exchanged. Um, up until the last three or four years that has primarily, primarily been through standardizing the approach in relation to secure FTP sites but increasingly um, the DDEX standards are turning to web services um, in order to automate the actual process of exchange as well. Um, and that we anticipate is something that will become more and more common with the DDEX standards as we move forward over the next uh, few years. So currently uh, DDEX has eight families of standards. And what I mean by that is very often the standard is named by a, a, a single name, but it will contain more than one particular message format because it's actually a series of messages that need to be exchanged in order for um, um, effective communication around that particular business transaction. 
And so you see here the sort of key roles of companies that exist in the music value chain and the different colored lines between uh, each of them indicate which type of uh, DDEX standard message they would ordinarily exchange. Obviously, some of these companies could be exchanging three or four or more different standard D DDEX messages, um, but each one will um, be in relation to a particular business transaction that, that is being undertaken in those circumstances. Um, and, um, and so the, the message is slightly different. However, um, we do have common building blocks throughout um, the DDEX standards, which we replicate um, throughout them. So there's a lot of commonality between the standards, even though there are some variances which are there to, to, uh, to, to deal with particular uh, business or types of business transactions. And so the focus for our seminar webinar today are the two standards, the Sales and Usage Reporting, DSR, and the Claim Detail Message, CDM. Um, the first of those is exchanged between DSPs and various different types of rights owners. So in cases of musical works, that could be a music publisher or a, an author's rights society. And in the case of sound recordings, that will usually be a record company, but may on occasions be a distributor acting on behalf of a client record company. And the CDM, which is the main focus of today, is really only for exchanging claim data between uh, authors' rights societies or music publishers and the DSPs that have previously sent them a DSR sales usage report. So that is our focus uh, today. Um, DDEX is now really uh, pretty ubiquitous. Um, we've issued over five and a half thousand implementation licenses, which would suggest that somewhere in the region of five and a half thousand companies intended to implement the standards. Unfortunately, DDEX itself doesn't have any information about implementations. We obviously know that a lot of our members have implemented the various standards, but beyond that, we don't have any um, uh, direct information. But what we do know is that um, no uh, serious company operating in this space is not using DDEX to some extent or another. The last thing, the last general point I would like to make is about uh, the data dictionary, which is really the beating heart of DDEX and all its standards. And it has become the lingua franca of the music industry. If you don't speak DDEX, um, it's not going to be easy to communicate um, with your business partners uh, unless you use proprietary uh, formats. Um, and increasingly, uh, companies need to be able to speak DDEX to be able to communicate with their business partners. The data dictionary contains all the semantics of all the terms of all the messages, but also it contains um, the structure of what we call common composites. So these are groupings of data points that help describe certain entities like a sound recording or a musical work or a party. Um, and these um, composites are used throughout the standards in a common way. Sometimes they're just slightly tweaked um, for special cases, but by and large, you will see these composites appearing um, throughout the standards uh, in different ways, being, being used for different purposes, but nevertheless, the structure of the composite remains pretty much the same. So turning really to sort of set the scene for um, what we're talking about and the importance of the DSR and uh, CDM standards. Um, the benefits of using and deploying these are that clearly DSR and CDM are worldwide industry standards. DDEX is a global organization um, with global members um, who have um, all input into the creation of the standards. Um, the DSR is, of course, already very widely adopted. Um, and the experiences that um, we have heard from our members is that both DSR and, by uh, implication, CDM are cheap to implement and maintain. 
Um, and they're relatively simple to, to implement as, as well, both for senders and receivers. Some of you will know that there already exists an XML version of the DSR uh, standard. Um, one of the reasons we moved to um, a flat file structure um, was because the volumes using XML were becoming unmanageable. Um, and what the use of an adoption of the DSR flat file has done is to massively reduce uh, the volumes involved in, in the actual uh, messages themselves. So as I said, we've moved to this flat file structure, flat file approach. is much easier to ingest. Um, the reason for that is that the way we have structured it is the data about um, sound recordings and musical works and the sales lines in relation to those are self-contained in what we call blocks, which means that you can ingest that data and start processing it um, before having to ingest the whole message. Whereas the way XML, the XML version was structured, you needed to ingest the whole thing um, before you could do anything with it. And we've taken the same approach with the CDM standard um, so the same will be true of that. Um, we believe that both of them are structured in the way that there is um, plenty of flexibility for business partners to determine whether they um, exchange information only about uh, one business model or multiple business models. And we also believe that the, the standards adapt pretty quickly to new business models. Uh, one sort of final comment about the past, as it were, uh, the XML version of DSR and uh, the non DDEX standard known as CCID um, were created in a download world, sort of pre-2010. Um, and obviously, the world has changed significantly since then. So the flat file standards that we now have for DSR and CDM accommodate all business models. Um, and uh, offer more data attributes and functionality than, than the previous versions. We've also provided a complete choreographer, choreography by pulling these two standards together, um, and, and we'll demonstrate that um, in a moment. Uh, and in particular, with regard to CDM, it's going to offer greater transparency, traceability, and auditability of the royalty transactions Whereas using um, DSR and CCID, it was quite difficult to match up information about the same transactions, which meant that a lot of manual work was involved. Um, and as I think I've said already, there's the, the evolution of the standards, we believe, is, is pretty easy because of the way they're structured in terms of new business models and requirements that may come along. Um, I see there is a question. Oh, no, that's Niels. Um, so uh, that's all I have to say for now. Uh, I'm going to pass now on to Laurent, who will talk to you about the, the, the flow of royalties that's created um, by the use of uh, CDM and uh, DSR. Thank you, Mark. Uh, hi, everyone. <clears throat> so how DSR and CDM enables the flows of uh, royalties? Uh, so, uh, first, uh, there are two standards. Uh, the first one is uh, DSR, so the Digital Sales Report Standard that allows uh, the licenses, which, which are uh, usually DSPs, to send uh, their sales usage and, and the different uh, revenues uh, generated from the distribution. distribution. Uh, of products uh, to the different uh, licensors. Uh, and the second standard is a CDM, so the claim detail message that in return allows the licensors uh, of the of musical works to, uh, to claim uh, uh, and to, to, to send their claims to the licensees in respect of the works uh, used in the different, uh, uh, in these uh, DSR reports. Uh, so what is the principle of this message? First, about uh, DSR. So the DSP sent uh, to the right controller, uh, to the licensor, uh, this uh, sales report, where there are the releases, 
uh, the different resources, the sales usage information for uh, the musical works and the sound recordings and music videos. Um, in return, uh, for C the CDM, then the, uh, the licensor sent to the licensee. Uh, so the CDM with uh, the claims and the invoice, uh, invoice details for, on, um, for the musical works, this licensor has, uh, has claimed. Uh, in terms of format, uh, on DSR, we used uh, XML in the past. It has been phased out. And now we are using uh, the flat file. Uh, we, name, we name it DSRF. Uh, on CDM, uh, there is one format, which is a flat, uh, flat file. So how the choreography uh, runs? Uh, you have two columns. The first on the left, you have the licensee. On the right, you have the licensor. So uh, first, the licensee, uh, once he has uh, so um, used uh, and distributed the, the music, will send to the, uh, to the licensor this uh, DSR, uh, DSR files. Uh, then the licensor received that, he ingests uh, this, uh, this uh, sales report and he, he can uh, send uh, acknowledgement file, which is uh, just a technical file to, to send to, to say, uh, uh, to tell to the licensee, okay, I, I received the file. Then the, uh, the licensor uh, uh, match all these different uh, release and resources that have been sent with his system uh, match the different works he represents, and then uh, calculate the claims and send back to the licensee the CDM containing all these uh, all these claims. Uh, then the receive uh, the licensee uh, receives it, uh, ingests it in his uh, system, and here there are two, uh, and he can send. Of course, also a technical acknowledgement file saying, "Okay, I received uh, your file." Uh, then there are two, uh, two, uh, let's say, uh, other flows uh, uh, that are, uh, are managed on, um, let's say, um, on a bilateri, bilateral, uh, bilateral, bilateral uh, way between the licensee and the licensor. Uh, the first one is that um, in case of discrepancy, here we are talking about technical discrepancy. Uh, it can be uh, an error in the format of the file itself. Uh, it can be also um, a problem. Uh, typically, uh, you didn't use the correct uh, tariff uh, in that context. Um, for this type of discrepancies, uh, then there is a standard that is named uh, of a profile that is named uh, CDM record discrepancies then that the licensee can send back to the, to the licensor. And there is uh, also a second uh, profile uh, that is named overclaim discrepancies that the licensee use in that case to uh, communicate to the licensors with a S um, when there are uh, overclaim, meaning when there are uh, some licensors who claim for the same uh, title, for the same release, um, and where there is uh, more than 100% that is claimed. So in case uh, this happens, then uh, this standard can be, uh, can be used. So you have understood that there are two standards, but uh, using one architecture, uh, it, also, uh, it is, it's used also the same uh, value sets. Uh, of course, it, it has been designed to work together. Uh, so on CDM, you can precisely reference an individual sales user record. Uh, so yeah, everything is, of course, 100% compliant. Before we get to Zach, um, there, there's, there's a question here. Uh, why did DDX decide to develop CDM in the first place, given that we have other standards? Mark alluded to that um, a bit earlier. Is there anything? that you want to add or could add to that? 
short sure. statement. Uh, sure, and um, yeah, here we, we need to provide maybe some 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 background on that. Um, I can recap where, where we are coming from. Uh, originally, we had a, we had a, a standard named CCID. Uh, this standard was uh, I don't know running since uh, a decade, maybe something like that, uh, and which had been originally de developed by the European licensors and a big uh, licensee, a big DSP that was providing download services at the beginning of uh, online services. So uh, you understand that originally this, uh, this uh, system, this uh, CCID uh, standard, uh, has been developed for, for, the, for the download services. Uh, so, and we had, in the meantime, we had many, many new business models. Um, so, uh, UGC business models, uh, subscription with a streaming, uh, audio tier, many different uh, business models. Uh, so we had to adapt uh, that. Um, Another thing is that it was uh, it was not also uh, a, a worldwide uh, a worldwide uh, standard uh, because you had also uh, many other uh, standards used in some uh, in some uh, territories. CCID was not used only in Europe; uh, it was also used in other uh, continents. But uh, you had still some uh, specific formats in some continents and uh, some territories. Uh, so this was uh, one one main uh, point. Uh, and uh, then we we, uh, we we it was the right home. Direct was the right home as we had um, all the DSPs, all the all the licenses, all the licensors in the same room. Um, who had designed furthermore uh, DSRF to send the sales reports and then to design uh, the answer to uh, the DSRF uh, uh, and which uh, became then uh, CDM. Hope I answer to your question, Amit. Um, works for me. Um, Zach, do you have from the other side of the table, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, I think that, uh, you know, Mark and Laurent have answered the question quite eloquently already. Um, you know, as far as the fact that, you know, CCID was, uh, you know, more download centric when it was, uh, when it was actually being, uh, you know, discussed initially. And um, since then, you know, streaming has really taken over um, and we needed to, to build something that was a little bit more, m more modern uh and and you know cdm allowed us to do that and it also um allowed us to kind of you know repurpose some of the existing architecture that we have with dsr into cdm which means essentially if you know how to read a dsr message you know you, you should know how to read a cdm message and you you probably should be familiar with um you know how to get the information from from DDEX, uh, you know, website and, and and so on. So I think, you know, overall, I think it was just, uh, you know, it gave us the opportunity to put all of the, you know, incoming and outgoing reports in, you know, using the same DDEX choreography across the entire music supply chain. Um, and, and one last thing I just want to mention, it, it's pretty good to be able to um, reference a DSR message within a CDM message um you know whether it's in a header file or, or something like that so you can you can make that those links and associations so um I, I think everything that mark and laurent have mentioned in addition to what i just said is is really why we decided to go with cdm thanks zach um i'll hand over to you now in relation to the development of cdm sure yeah so um I think you know it's 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 important for you know for especially for those of us who are on the call who who've never uh, been in any of the working groups or plenary meetings. I'll discuss discuss a little bit about you know the DDEX general operation, how how we do things, how how we you know get a standard out the door. Um, you know essentially it's it's broken out into into two different. Um, groups or meetings if you will uh, one of them is uh, obviously the working group and the other one is the is the plenary meeting 
the working group, it, it, you know, the way I like to see it, it it's mainly um, a forum where licensors and licensees get together. Uh, they, you know, we sit in a room and we kind of, you know, you know, set the requirements, uh, discuss, you know, the commercial needs of, of each of each uh, business to see what what it is that they need to make this standard work for them, whether it be, you know, something from a sales usage message or something from a from a claim and detail message. Um, we kind of sit sit and discuss those. So I, I would say that the working group is really where all the heavy heavy lifting happens. Um, you know, if we don't uh, get through, you know, th these are usually in person, right, where we um, kind of discuss over like a two or two day period. Um, and if we don't finish any of the items that we've discussed, we usually can follow that up in a in a you know telephone conference uh, where we kind of share documents online. Um, and uh, and then what we end up doing, you know, usually around two times per year, we have these plenary meetings where we kind of bubble up all of the work that we've done in the uh, working groups, and not just DSR, but you know, this goes across all working groups. Um, where we kind of discuss, uh, you know, where we are at, what it, what it is that we still, you know, need to work on, and um, and kind of, you know, any any additional future work items that we want that we might want to focus on. And usually this happens, um, you know, as I said, twice a year, usually once on the East Coast and once on the West Coast um, in the U.S. Um, and yeah, and and this is a forum where we where we review. Our progress and all of the work that's done at DDEX is, is obviously done by consensus. So, um, you know, Niels and Mark do a great job in moderating and ensuring that, um, you know, that there are no biases and, and everything is done uh, with the consensus from the group as a whole. Next slide. Yeah, so in, on this slide, I'll just talk about the, um, you know the development of the DSR and the CDM standards. Uh, you know it, this this slide really is is mainly what happens in the working group. I would say you know we usually take a starting point like uh, you know a DSR standard for example, or you know when we were working on the CDM we we took the the CCID format because it was something already existing and we wanted to kind of break that down and see you know how we can make it better when we look at CDM. Uh, so we we analyze the you know what weaknesses it had, how we can make it better. Uh, we introduce you know some some new requirements that weren't previously there before. Um, you know we also threw in the, the summary records, which which a lot of people find useful that CCID didn't have. So these are the kind of starting points that we look at, and then and then we take that through the development process where we. Um, you know, again, get get the proposals from the from the members to see what it is that they need from their businesses to make this work for them, um, and we kind of discuss it in a in a usually friendly manner, <laughs> and uh, it it goes pretty smooth um, most of the time. Uh, and then you know we we iterate through it until we f we feel like it's it's ready to be bubbled up to to the board, and and then you know Niels puts together a uh, the committee draft, and then usually we have about 30 days to um, to have any editorial comments. And if there are no editorial comments within that 30-day period, uh, then uh, Niels goes ahead and and you know publishes that as a as an official standard. And that's you know that's the end to end pipeline for for the general operation that we undergo. There are two more questions uh, um, that have bubbled up here. Um, the main objectives from uh, when DDEX started working on the CDM standard, I think um, we've answered that, or is there anything that you need to to add to that? No, just that, uh, you know, we wanted to have, uh, you know, a unified worldwide, you know, invoicing solution that was, you know, not just European centric that likes CCID, but, but more, Global, and I think we've achieved that with uh, with the CDM standard. Uh, maybe one word on uh, on licensor uh, side on that. Uh, same as um, as DSPs uh, to get a harmonized solution, uh, keeping things as simple as possible for being uh, widely uh, adopted, uh, and get a robust uh, solution also to embrace uh, all types of uh, businesses. 
Uh, and um, so with all actors around the table to get a solution, um, compatible with all needs, all business models, uh, and claiming all type of works. Uh, what we didn't mention at the time being is that uh, we, we, we mentioned musical works, but uh, you know, uh, we can also uh, report uh, audiovisual uh, at the time being. So it can be also other types of works. At the time being, CDM has been designed to handle uh, musical works, but in future, we, we think also about, of course, uh, adding uh, more uh, type of, uh, of works. Um, um, and maybe all, all what we said, get a, a stronger uh, choreography, um, uh, the possibility also to, to report uh, updates on the center side, um, uh, to accelerate, accelerate also the flow, uh, typically to receive the technical discrepancies, because at the time being, when we send, uh, when the licensor send um, a CCID, uh, sometimes, uh, I don't know, there is a technical issue, and then uh, the time to process it, to, to analyze it, and to, to check, wow, there is an issue, and so on, it can take uh, days. Uh, here, there, is, there are mechanisms that uh, enable to, uh, to send back automatically, okay, there is an issue, so then the licensor is aware about that. So yeah, many uh, expectations to, to have something more robust, more industrialized, um, which is uh, great for everyone. Uh, Zach has already talked about um, the process that we went through to develop those standards. Were there any specific issues in that development that we needed to address and tackle and overcome? Um. Well, I, I just think this is a general, uh, you know, issue, uh, which is, you know, navigating, you know, the DDEX website whenever we have new updates. Uh, I, I think, I think that that's something that Niels, you mentioned, uh, you know, you guys are working on to to better improve for the future. But I think I think that's that's one of the complexities that that we found. Yeah, maybe one extra word on that is, uh, yes, also we have, we have to find a, we had some, some difficulties based on, uh, because we, we, we have always to find um, a good balance uh, between the, the business needs, which are, of course, uh, different. We have uh, actors uh, from all over the world, uh, different continents, and so different uh, needs. Uh, so this is, uh, I would say this is part of the game. And I take this, the opportunity uh, here to, to thank you very much, the, the, the DSR working group, and also the secretariat for all the very uh, uh, good jobs that has been done, always very uh, positive, and to find and we have always found, um, I think, good solutions uh, to all these uh, different uh, changes. Speaking of good solutions, should we have a look at the CDM standard itself, how it, how it looks like and how it to some extent compares to the DSR standard. So Laurent has already um, talked about this overall choreography that we have. The CDM message, the main CDM message is where rights controller or administrator who has been in receipt of a sales and usage report, doesn't have to be a DDEX DSR message, but in, in ideal circumstances would be one of those, and then reply back to typically the DSP with the claim and detail message. But there can then also be a communication back. Laurent mentioned that all of those um, discrepancies that a DSP might find in a claim or detail message that can be communicated back. And then in response to such a discrepancy notification, the rights controller or administrator may then want to send an updated claim detail message and we have a slightly different format for those updates to the original claim detail message because we need slightly different information to be communicated there these updates do not need to wait for a uh, for a discrepancy but that is typically when they're sent but it is also possible that a rights controller administrator just learns that um, they have more rights or less rights than they claimed last week, and they can then send an update proactively. But typically it would happen in response to a discrepancy notification. 
we're going to hammer down this point um, uh, this afternoon or this morning. CDM and DSR are designed to work together. Um, they use the same architecture. The terminology across both of those standards, Mark talked about the um, DDEX data dictionary, which is so important to have a common nomenclature across the entire supply and value chain. Well, this is even more important when it comes to CDM and DSR because they need to work so closely to work to, together. Therefore, yes, we do have consistent and common semantics of terms between them. Very important, Zach highlighted that already, is the clear linking between a sales usage line and a claim invoice line. When you claim for a specific sound recording or a specific usage of a specific sound recording, then you need to be able to point to exactly that usage record so that when the DSP receives your claim, they can then say, ah, that's with respect to that line in the sales user report, so that in the end they can check, do they have, have they received for each individual sales line one claim or at least one claim or, or have they received too many claims? In which case they can then go and send a um, discrepancy notification. And also critical, um, CDM supports all the DSR profiles, whether it's UGC, whether it's basic audio, whether it's audiovisual, the CDM standard supports them all, with one exception, and that is the uh, reporting to labels, to record companies, because the claiming is uh, the claim and detail message is all about musical work, so record companies are of um, are not really interested in those, at least not in this context. Also quite interesting, uh, and one of those benefits of why it's good to have both standards maintained by the same body is that while we were developing the CDM standard, we realized that we were actually missing one important aspect, which ends up in a new DSR profile, the master list profile, and that deals with what's quite often called pre-usage or pre-claim um, processes. I'll come and talk about that in a little bit. So the, the, those two bits, um, or the, those two profiles, or those two aspects is, is up on this and the next slide. Traditionally, what happens is that a record company um, provides a DSP with material to sell, to make available, whether that's stream, whether that's download, doesn't really matter. The DSP makes the content available to consumers who then enjoy the music, hopefully, and um, based on the usages that those consumers then trigger, the DSP sends a sales usage report to the works license holes or an agent thereof. The works licensor then can map the information from the sales usage report into uh, to the data that they store in their local system or the works registrations that they have received and, and the likes. And then based on those sales and usage information, which contains then also how much revenue was generated based on each of those sound recordings, they can then make claims and they can also say how much royalty would then be due for each of those individual sales lines. Well, more and more, um, there is a slight change to this process. This doesn't work everywhere, but in those cases where it works, it actually offers some benefit. Because if the DSP could already provide the works licensor with the information of what they are about to make available to consumers, or what they are in the process of making available to consumers, then the works licenses can actually start doing the, these mapping exercises much earlier in the in the whole value chain and the cycle, and thereby speeding things up, giving more time for the DSP and the works licensor to actually hash out any issues that may find with the, with the matching and and so forth. And this pre-usage process is something that we then added to the CDM standard, and then we added to the DSR standard, the master list profile, to support the pre-usage process. Clearly, in a pre-usage CDM message, there wouldn't be any financial information because the DSP hasn't yet provided any financial information to the works license or in the first place. And that's 
um, the difference between the pre-usage and the post-usage CDM process. One contains financial information, invoice details, the other one simply doesn't. The other concepts that we needed to make sure we can cover um, and they come out of the DSR is the, 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 the differentiation between single and multi-context reports. Again, traditionally, reports covered usually one territory, one currency, one commercial model, one use type, and one service type, one service tier. So you had, I don't know, pay-as-you-go downloads in France based on euros, and it's the student tier. And if you, if a DSP offered two of those services, maybe they have exactly the same, but also for Germany, then they would need to send two single um, context reports. So there would then be two, what we call sales context, two reports. It does mean that a lot of the data is though duplicated, at least for pan-European licensing bodies, for example. And in this case, wouldn't it be more efficient to actually wrap those into one sales usage file? Yes, it would. At least it would if both sender and recipient are actually able to, to, to process these because it is a slightly different setup for processing. So we enabled the DSR standard to be able to deal with single context re, uh, sales and usage reports as well as multi-context sales and usage reports. And we made sure that the CDM standard can also deal with those. It, by the way, does not mean that if you're receiving a multi-context DSR, that you have to send a multi-context CDM in response. Those could be split up in, in single context um, slices, if you like. That all just depends on a bilateral agreement between the two parties involved. If they both like both messages in multi-context, great. But if one of them doesn't have the capabilities, then you can um, make it slightly simpler in the, in the setup. You buy that with a little bit more data that needs to be exchanged. When you put all of this together, you end up with six different profiles. There are three profiles that deal with CDM, the core CDM. You have one that deal, or two that deal with post-usage, and you have two that deal with pre-usage. And the two in each case are the original CDM and an update CDM. So if you multiply two by two, you arrive at four different CDM profiles. In addition, there are two profiles for the two different types of discrepancies that Laurent mentioned. One that deals with record discrepancies, wrong um, calculation, maths errors, or wrong, potentially wrong, wrong matches, wrong royalty rate that has been applied, those kind of discrepancies. And if I say wrong, I mean wrong in the eyes of the DSP in this case. It may of course be that the DSP actually is in error and that the CDM was correct. But in this case, the DSP thinks there's something wrong. I think there's a discrepancy. Here is a discrepancy. And the second one that deals with overclaims, as I already, as Laurent said, um, if there's more than 100% claimed on a musical work, well, that can't be. Therefore, um, you need to be able to, to complain about that as a DSP. And because we can count and we start counting with part one rather than with part three, there are two additional parts, one that provides you with the architecture and one that defines the record types, the long rows that are actually in the um, in the tables. And last but not least, there is one part that deals with all the allowed values, the code lists. But because, again, we want to make sure that the DSR and the CDM standard use the same nomenclature, well, we use the same part that the DSR part uses for all those allowed values. So that a, a pay-as-you-go model means the exact same in the DSR as well as in the CDM standard. And this is also one of the reasons why um, Zach quite um, correctly um, complains that the 
that the navigation on the knowledge base where all the standards are held is quite complex because you have um, 10 different parts for the DSR standard and five different parts for the CDM standard. Um, that gives you quite a number of different documents to handle and different uh, things to look at, which makes the navigation quite complex. But as he also said, we are in the process of hopefully making this much better in the future. Let me just briefly talk about the overall architecture that the files use. And this is exactly the same slide that I used last week when I talked about DSR, because it uses exactly the same um, setup. It's a tabulator separated value file, so you can just import it into any spreadsheet application, as long as the file is small enough. Um, so all the individual columns are separated by tabulators. We have the ability to communicate multiple data points in one cell, though, which is quite important if you need to communicate five, six or ten writers for a song. Um, we can't just allow a certain number of cells for that because there may be more writers on a musical work. So this needs to be kind of theoretically endless. Um, and there, therefore, we use a secondary delimiter. We use the pipe character, like you see there with Lennon McCartney. Um, but you can also escape those those um, characters if somebody really wants to put a pipe character into a band name or a title of a of a recording or work. Also important, we can handle all scripts and all languages because we use UTF-8 very much like all the XML standards and very much like the DSR standard as well. So it's a flat file but it's a structured flat file. What does that mean? Well, that means that we have different record types. We have record types that give you general information about the file itself, headers and footers. The header contains information about who sends the message to whom, when was it created, what's the file name and, and so forth. And the footer just is a, is a check, checks and balances line at the very end, which says how many lines were in the file so that you, when you receive the file, know that you have received it all and it wasn't garbled on the way to you. Then there is a summary information. Um, summary information summary records as we call them that contains information so that you can see on a glance what is actually in the file so that you don't need to go into the details and and look at them um, and sum things up um, manually if you like so if you receive for example a, a discrepancy message it will tell you in the summary how much money actually is now being disputed. You don't need to sum that up. And then in the end, you have those detailed informations. In the case of the CDM, it's those claims, those updated claims, or those discrepancies. So how does that look in, in, in pretty colors? You have the header and you have the footer, and you have always exactly one of those. And if we're talking about post-claim, the traditional approach, you then have a summary record th that describes what sales context we are dealing with, which territory, which use type, which commercial type, which currency, and which um, service tier has been used. You then have financial summary records um, that can, can be provided underneath that. And then you have all those detailed CDM records. The green auxiliary records is something I'm not going to go into. Um, that can provide additional information that may help um, the recipient to, to understand what's being communicated. But the, the orange CD01, that's the claim detail record type 01, that contains the resource that has been used, the work that has been used, the rights claims made for the mechanical, for the um, performing rights um, and, and, and amalgamated rate um, for the territory, for the specific right, for a specific time as per summary record. And then you can have um, invoice details, potentially how much royalty is being, being requested or is being calculated from that information. 
based on the DSR record that is being referenced in that CDO one line. And I'll show you how that referencing works in a moment. The pre-usage claim looks more or less the same, except that you have a different detailed records. Well, it's virtually the same re record. It's just cut, uh, cut at the end because you just don't have those financial royalty um, fields. You only have those fields that identify the work and that provide a claim, how many percentage and so forth. Um, and you don't have any financial summary record because hey, you can't because there's no financial information. Otherwise, those two um, specifications or those two parts are virtually the same. So if you understand one, you understand the other. I mentioned corrections. In order to communicate corrections to both of those profiles, it's exactly the same uh, file. It looks exactly like that, except that you have different um, detailed records. So you use a record which we call CD02 instead of the CD01, and a record we call CD04 instead of CD02 for the pre-usage. And the only difference that those have, so CD02 has over CD01, for example, is that all those financial fields that can be updated in a, in a correction exist in three versions. What was originally communicated, what is now communicated, and what is the delta. So for example, I used to claim 50%, now I'm claiming 40%, so that's a delta of minus 10%. This gives them the recipient of the, of the correction um, quite a good idea of what has changed, where it has changed, so that we can make sure that all the information is, is, um, is, is dealt with. Um, there's one question though about the, um, about the, the, the record type. Um, why don't we have any differentiation between multi-record block variant and uh, single record block variant um, in CDM because the DSR standard, those of you who have looked at that standard, have already, uh, that standard does provide that and makes quite extensive use of those two features. Uh, Laurent, do you want to, to have a look at that or, or can you give an answer to that? Uh, yes, uh, sure. Um, in this uh, CDM it's a webinar, um, we didn't uh, explain why uh, we, we designed uh, for DSR that way. Um, one important thing to understand is that in the context of DSR, when we move to the, to the, to the flat file, we had also one thing in mind is that <clears throat> to facilitate also the processing. Because originally, uh, in the XML files, you have first you had the uh, the metadata, and then you had the sales information, uh, which was quite uh, difficult for, especially on the licensor side, because you had first to ingest the system, and then to read it again for one simple reason: is that because of, first the files were huge. And second, because um, you, you, you need both information, metadata and sales information to uh, identify and calculate your claims. So uh, in the context of DSR, we, we, we create this st structured flat file in order to answer to that need with, with uh, what Niels presented with a, a notion of blocks. Uh, now in, in the context of CDM is uh, is completely different. Uh, we, uh, the license source, report claims re relative to one set line. So uh, we found simpler to, to keep it as a single row, uh, standard, uh, as it was the case uh, originally also for the CCID. Okay. Um, the other question that came up is, um, how does the, the CDM standard mirror the structure of the DSR standard? Um, you talked about the 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 multi versus single record block, but um, the the overall structure. Is there anything else to add to what I've said? One word is is that yeah, CDM is a response, as you all have understood, is a response to a to a DSR. So the structure has to to be completely aligned with DSR, 
uh, and the varying business uh, needs uh, required by the licenses uh, that uh, now are reported uh, via the DSRF. Zach, do you want to add anything to this, or should I continue? Uh, well, I mean, I think I think we've uh, pretty much talked about it all. But yeah, I mean, you know, DSR and CDM are in lockstep with each other now, whereas whereas before it wasn't, you know, that uh, clear with with when when we had the CCID. So so I think I think that's the biggest takeaway that that you know we should we should uh, uh, you know have from this discussion. Okay, good. In that case, let me actually talk about um, discrepancies. We talked about the discrepancies. Um, we don't need to look at them anymore. Um, let me actually walk you through a sample on the knowledge base that, or, or the, the sample on the knowledge base, um, to give you a feel of how the whole thing works. Um, and it it actually gives a little story that we put together. So that there's a basic audio DSR from a DSP sent to um, to, to licensors, and they get two replies from two licensors to that. And then the, 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 the DSP detects a discrepancy or two discrepancies, an overclaim discrepancy and a record discrepancy. Uh, the first, the record discrepancy, just goes to the one licensor who made that Parent error, potential error, and the uh, overclaim discrepancy then would of course go to both of those licensors who are party to that overclaim, and then we'll see a correction at the end. So let's start uh, with the DSR. Um, this is just a simple DSR. Please note the colours here are simply for for our own um, ease of of reading it. The real world, of course, will will if it's a TSV file, there will not be any color, there will not be any bold face and, and the like. Um, also important, and the same applies to DSR as well as to the CDM standard, is at the beginning, um, you, those lines with white background, they're all commentary. They're not formally part of the standard or the message, but they make reading the standard or the, the file actually much easier because you know, for example, that um, in the header record, the, the third column is the profile. So this is a basic audio profile in the profile version 1.1 and so forth. And the date time when the message was created was the 25th of October, 2019. So what do we have here? We have a um, release or we have three releases with a total of six sound recordings that the DSP has has traded, has offered, and consumers have uh, downloaded those six tracks or those three releases containing those six tracks. Um, please note that each of those sales and usage records, those, those are the light blue lines, has its own identifier. And this will become a when we go back to the CDM message because then they will be able to point to these six lines individually. So here is licensor number one's claim. I'm not going to show you licensor two's claim because it will look more or less the same so it's kind of boring. Um, and you see two different things here. You, use the, you see the summary information in CS01 um, you see that it's a the, the, the music streaming service of that company um, and it goes to licensor number one and you have the identifier of licensor number one, which is the PADPDA 0123 and so forth. Um, and at the very top, you have again the, the header information, which looks more or less like the header in the, the DSR message. It's slightly different um, for good reasons, but otherwise you'll, you'll recognize it um, when you see it. The footer is the same as actually the footer for the single record block variants of the DSR standard. Each of those records also has its identifier and we will need them 
for complaining about this uh, CDM message. So when you want to send a notification about a discrepancy, you need to say which line has been um, are you complaining about. And you can complain about a summary record as well as you can complain about a detailed record. So that's why the CSO one as well as the CDO ones all have their own unique identifiers. And if we're going a bit further uh, along, you see that the title of the work that has been um, that that has been claimed, and you find six lines. By the way, there are six claims: one for each of the works, the sound recordings, or the works of the sound recordings that were in the DSR message. You see the writers, and there you see, for example, Brian Wilson and Michael Love for Good Vibrations. Um, that is one of those cases where you have two data entries in one cell. You have their IPI numbers. And if we're going further along, you see that the share mechanical is provided, the share performing is provided, and a blended share is being provided for mechanical and performance. And then, hey, there is, those are the percentages claimed, and there you have the sales transaction ID that we have in the sales report. And if we would go back to a couple of slides before, you will realize that those numbers were exactly the same numbers that you found in the light blue records there that describe you the individual sales and usages. And if we then go, go further, because this is a post-claim case, you then um, have information about the revenue that has been generated based on those recordings and the revenue information um, to, to calculate the royalties on. And at the far end, you then have the invoice details. If the whole thing would be a pre-usage scenario, those claimed amounts and what we've just seen on the previous slide, that would simply not be there. That, but that's the some difference between the pre-claim and the post-claim or the pre-usage and post-usage um, approach. Otherwise, those records are actually the same. But the DSP who received that record, that report, rather that CDM report, wasn't really happy about it. They found some issues with it. And here is now the discrepancy. And it's a record discrepancies that are being uh, complained about. And CDD1 is the, the record that deals with record discrepancies. CDD2 is the record that deals with overclaim discrepancies. So here we're dealing with record discrepancies. There is the ID from the um, CDM message that I've shown you a bit earlier. So you now can see that the, the last of those CDD1 lines, for example, discrepancy 105, those also have their own identifiers, by the way, but this uh, discrepancy 105 is with, the, is with respect to the sixth line of the CDM message. And if we're going a bit further down, we see that here is something that is different. Um, and I'll just go for the for the third line now, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the third one there has a the value found in the claimed amount at the very left of 40.42 but they expected a value of 20.21, so the difference is 40. Well, somebody can't, oh no, the impact is 40.42, sorry. Um, because the, the potential um, value is 40.42, so you would typically, I guess, use the, the value found in, in the impact. So if this whole, um, claim would fall to pieces, then there are 40.42 euros at stake. Now the licensor um, would know that um, there is something wrong with the claimed amount in that one um, record or at least that the DSP believes that something is wrong, because 40.42 may very well be the right um, amount. Uh, 
Um, and the reason why we included this royalty impact in currency of invoicing, as it's called, is because that now gives the licensor a chance to prioritize, prioritize the work. One of those items there has an impact of 111 euros, one has one of less than three euros. Would it make more sense to start with the one that has the highest impact and then work the way through? Therefore, you need that information. Could that be generated from all the other information? Yes, but isn't it better if you have that information right at the, the tip of your um, finger there? And now we're coming to the overclaim discrepancies, and that's where we use CDD2 and CDD3 records. CDD2 provides you information about um, the work itself, and CDD3 records contain then the information about the individual claims, which are apparently in conflict with one another. So let's have a look at what we're seeing here. So we, you see CDD, the three CDDs, three records, the two three CDD3 records, they are one to licensor one and one to licensor two. And, and mind, you would send this message to both of those companies. In this case, it's the one that goes to license or one, but you would send basically the same message to license or two, and therefore um, both of those companies can now get together and agree who actually should claim what and how much. So it's an overclaim, as you can see, bang in the middle of the of the of the screen and the dark blue line, and it's not being paid as things stand because that's the policy of the DSP. They don't pay if there's an overclaim and they can signal that to both of those parties and saying, you need to sort that, otherwise there is no payment. Um, all subject to the overall agreement between the, the parties, of course. Come on, move. Um, and when we're looking at the far end, we see that licensor one actually claimed 60% for Barbara Rand and licensor two claimed 50%. That's more than um, 100%, therefore, um, the overclaim. Um, and then the, the correction or the update, as I said earlier, um, it's the same as the original me uh, record. So CDO2, which is the update for um, post usage is like CDO1, except that if we're going further to the to the right, you see that, for example, the exchange rate now appears thrice. You have it as how it was originally, as, uh, not, not the exchange rate, sorry, the share claimed mechanical in this case. You have it as originally claimed, as corrected, and the delta. So if we're looking at the very last line there, it used to be 120, it is now 100, and that's a, an impact of minus 20. So that was the whistle-stop tour of how the, uh, the CDM standard looks like. Thank you very much, Niels. Um, we're now going to uh, go on to um, hear from some members of DDEX about their DSR implementation experiences and what their plans are um, to the extent they exist with regard to CDM implementation. So I said right at the beginning of the webinar, we have two licensors, uh, Laurent, who you've um, seen already, with two hats on, uh, his Sassam hat and also his Armonia hat, and I'm sure he will explain that. And then David Butler from iServices. And then secondly, uh, Zach, who you've already heard from, uh, from YouTube, and Chris, uh, Bly from Apple. Um, so I'm going to hand over first of all uh, to Laurent um, and um, he'll talk about our uh, Omenia's back office experience with regard to uh, DSR and SASEM's expectations going forward with regard to CDM. Uh, yes, so uh, maybe one word about uh, Armenia. So Armenia is a pan-European uh, hub 
uh, making online music uh, licensing and also um, a single uh, stop shop uh, for DSPs to process uh, the online rights. Um, I work in copyright, so I have to mention here that uh, these slides have been uh, prepared by uh, my colleague uh, Jacque uh, Lopez from uh, BIMAT, who is uh, uh, our partner in, uh, in uh, Harmonia to, to process uh, the files. Uh, so the main advantages I will uh, mention here uh, are in the context of uh, DSR. These slides have been prepared when we, last week, we presented um, DSRF. Uh, so, uh, in the context of DSR, the main uh, advantage and uh, advantages are first the implementation effort that has been reduced uh, compared to to XML version. Uh, it is uh, really uh, simpler. Uh, furthermore, there is a linear reader uh, with a structured uh, hierarchical schema. Uh, this is in echo with what I said before, uh, that, you know, we have in DSRF, we have blocks of information that combine uh, metadata and sales information. So this was really a, a big win. Um, corollary, uh, the memory footprint also is uh, negligible. This is a consequence. Um, so uh, no big amounts of data to be stored. Um, and the processing time uh, of the reports uh, has been highly reduced uh, between uh, five and uh, ten, ten times, which is also uh, linked with the, um, also the size of uh, the files that have been uh, also highly uh, reduced uh, mechanically uh, because we have uh, no more the, the tags. Uh, only the tags were representing roughly 80% of the volume. Uh, and as uh, um, Nils mentioned it, we, we have also this uh, multi-context aspect that in some cases can also reduce, uh, reduce the volumes uh, by really more than that. Um, one also other advantage, which is uh, technical, is uh, also parallelizable, which is uh, also really uh, really useful when you receive at the same time many, many files. Uh, one uh, other point we wanted to mention is the, uh, the fact that there is a tool to validate uh, the files, which is very useful, especially when you implement the, the standard and you want to, to be sure that your DSR is uh, compliant uh, with the specification. Uh, you can use this uh, validator tool that is a, a free tool that is on GitHub and that has been uh, developed by, uh, by Google. Uh, it works, let's say, uh, it's a similar to a schema file when you had uh, XML files in the past. Um, just a few format highlights. Uh, first one is a release, a release uh, reporting. So within a single block, you can report, report uh, um, all combinations of the different uh, resources. So this is something uh, that is uh, very powerful. Uh, there is also a single resource blocks uh, that uh, reduce volumes and processing time. It's in echo with, uh, especially for streaming services uh, where it's even uh, uh, more globalized, let's say. Uh, and uh, there is also a third point which is our more complete uh, UGC metadata uh, with uh, DSRF, uh, so to, to ingest, uh, to manage uh, UGC content. Um, one word about integration status. At the time being, <clears throat> we process uh, 15 DSPs uh, in production with uh, DSRF. Uh, it runs from the original version, which was the 1.0 to uh, the 1.2. Uh, you know, we have released uh, 1.3 very recently, but this is normal. No, no one has uh, adopted it yet, as I know, uh, which is because it's very recent. Um, next slide, please, Mark. Um, and this, I think, is very interesting. You see, it's um, 
sorry, on my screen, it's too small. I cannot see the years, but I think it runs from, it was 2019 at the end and 2015 at the beginning. Um, so you see, uh, we 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 pushed. A, we had the first release of standard <coughs> by uh, end of 2015. In 2016, we had only one implementation from one DSP. So it, um, you see, 2017, 2018, we were starting, and now in in, in 2019, uh, we had almost half of. Uh, Half of the files uh, sent uh, from all these dis from the DSPs sent using uh, DSRF, so it's growing now very rapidly. And uh, in 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 um, about volumes uh, next year, uh, so in 2021, we expect to have let's say most of the volume of the files uh, managed. Uh, using uh, DSRF. Um, now I will take my SASM hat, so switching to SASM hat, um, and to share about the experience of, uh, of, uh, of uh, experience, the expectations, because we have not yet implemented it, the standard is very recent. Uh, and uh, it is, um, in, in the context of Harmonia, it is uh, different Harmonia members who send straight their, uh, their, uh, their claim uh, on the invoice reports. So uh, what we expect on SASM is first, a better adaptability to the different business uh, needs. Uh, so as we said in, during this presentation, uh, all business models uh, with a full compliancy, uh, including also audiovisual works in the future, uh, it has been designed also to be easily adapted with uh, all the new uh, business models. So we ex expect um, a good adaptability also. Um, we uh, expect also better service for our clients uh, because uh, exactly as the same uh, when we set up, uh, we designed a, DS, a DSR, it means uh, for uh, on a license on licensee side, it's really easier when, of course, all the different license source, you can send the same, the same uh, file. Uh, and same here, it's um, if all licensors send C uh, CDM back the same standard to all different licenses, of course, it facilitates a lot uh, their work and minimize cost. Uh, and, and especially for the license source, um, for the license source, the licenses, sorry, not the license source, uh, working worldwide. Uh, we expect also a very uh, positive impact uh, as for DSR, a quick implementation, uh, a more robust and faster exchange, uh, as we said during this presentation, uh, and less fines also in the future, which is really important because uh, there are thousands and thousands of fines, and also an easier maintenance. Um, uh, for many reasons. First, there are all actors in the same room, uh, in the, uh, working in the DDEX DSR working group, and also it is uh, fully compliant with the DSR. So if we decide, okay, there is a new business model, we do some evolutions on DSRF, then we can in echo adapt uh, CDR. Uh, about implementation, uh, so uh, we are currently working uh, on the design and the development phase, uh, which uh, are ongoing. Uh, so uh, by uh, until uh, until uh, so 20, uh, 2021, uh, we expect some uh, impact on our information system uh, to ingest this, uh, these new fields, because there are new fields um, to manage uh, traceability, especially between DSR and CDM. Uh, when you do some back claimings, you send back uh, more information say, referring to uh, what uh, you uh, are updating, for instance. Uh, and there are also uh, new functionalities um, as a multi context uh, in return to a DSRF that has been sent in a multi context. Huh? So, as Nils explained, uh, typically on the territory, you receive all commercial offers. 
Uh, so you, you win a lot because you, have, uh, you send metadata once and only sales information depending on the different commercial offers. But back, when you send a CDM, you send a CDM with this, um, with this uh, multi-context uh, for the, all these different commercial offers. So we expect a lot with that. Um, and maybe one word, especially in Europe, uh, uh, because uh, uh, SASEM is uh, running in, uh, uh, of course, in a European, a European uh, society. So we, um, there are discussions ongoing uh, with um, several DSPs uh, and uh, European licensors uh, to implement CDM. Why? For a very simple reason is that in Europe, there are uh, some, uh, we have some process uh, to manage uh, conflicts or to manage residuals or to manage different, different elements. Uh, and for that, we need some consistency in the files that are exchanged between the licenses and the licensors. Uh, and you, in some cases, we can have uh, some uh, global switch, global switch from CCID to CDM when it is necessary. So in order to avoid to have at the same time some uh, licensors using CCID and others using CDM. Um, I think it's all. Okay, Laurent, thank you very much for that. Um, we'll now turn to Zach uh, at YouTube to talk about um, YouTube's experiences with the implementation of the DSR. Zach? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to talk about, you know, some of the challenges that, that we faced, uh, you know, very kind of like off the cuff experiences that we've uh, kind of had to undergo. Um, if anybody is also can relate to this, you know, perhaps you can also look at some of the best practices in the next couple of slides that I've uh, put together um, that can maybe help you as well. And, um, and also if there's anything that you want to chime in, uh, feel free to send a chat. Um, so some of the things that uh, that we've noticed is that there's, um, you know, th that during the working group sessions, uh, things can always change last minute. And therefore, you know, putting together a comprehensive implementation spec for our, en for our engineering team uh, needs to happen after it becomes an official DDEC standard. Um, and, the way that you know we're, we're such a huge team and there's so many other you know things that we're focusing on it usually takes us around you know two quarters to just you know put something on the docket for them to start working on you know that's that's what we call our OKRs, as uh, objectives and key results um so say that something gets released like you know for example you know ugc profile 1.3 back in july 23rd of this year you know it might take us you know, early 21 before we can actually start working on that. So a lot of times we, we receive lots of emails, you know, messages from our licensors asking, you know, when, when, when will you start building this so that they can also time their parsers to, um, to, to match the new standards. Um, and then, you know, Another challenge is that uh, the documentation on the DDEX website, as I mentioned earlier, it's it's quite difficult to you know just simply tell an engineer, yeah, you know, just go ahead and implement 1.3 on the uh, and go find it yourself on the DDEX website. They will they will get completely lost. They will not know what to do. And, and therefore, I think it's it's good that you know I represent YouTube at DDEX, and it and it's kind of like I'm the point the point man to kind of uh, handhold and tell them you know what needs to be actually implemented and, and so on um, but aside from all that what i also do is i put together a, a summary of changes um, which i'll discuss in, in the later chapter in, in the later slides that kind of talk about all the different changes that has been made to the standard since the last update that we've submitted um, next slide please yeah so uh, an additional challenge as well is is a, is adapting to the fast moving digital offerings and and this is something that I've been kind of uh, you know saying for a long time that uh, the the digital music industry moves moves faster than DDEX and um, and that makes it sometimes tough. For example, when we have a new service offering, um, you know we we usually get it released it gets released to the public on the DL you know so for example uh, the audio tier you know Google Home um we released it back in april and uh we needed to have it you know ready for reporting by may 
So um, that makes it difficult because, um, and this is April of last year, by the way. So this is make, makes it difficult because um, you know we 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 not we're not really uh, equipped uh, with our DDEX formats, you know, to have a, a standard that's that's ready to go. Um, what, what we usually do, and as Neil Niels likes to say, is we mangle the standards to to conform to what we need for our business. Um, a lot of times, you know, it works, and a lot of times we have to um, even add fields that are not in the standard because we have no other choice. Um, so, so that's that's another challenge that we're also, you know, yeah, DL stands for down low. Yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, that, that's another kind of challenge that we, we are facing. Um, next slide, please. So some of the best practices that, that we've, um, kind of took on, and I mentioned this earlier is, is what, you know, a lot of you who have worked with us have probably seen or have received a YouTube specific guideline document per service offering. So what this document essentially does is it, it's kind of like from all of the noise that you can get from the DDEX website that may not be relevant to you, um, this document is specific for our business and what we need to do um, in order to, to A, report and be compliant and B, fulfill our contractual obligations. So it, it talks about calculation methods used per field. Um, it specifically marks which fields we need to pay close attention to et cetera, et cetera. Um, in addition to, to that, we also put together um, an internal DSRF viewer, um, which, which compiles the massive files into a visual user interface. So you can, you know, we, we found this to be um, good twofold. One for, you know, it helps us check for inaccuracies. Um, uh, it also helps us navigate through massive files if we want to look for a particular asset type. If you don't mind just scrolling to the next slide really quick, I, we can, you know, probably talk about that. So if you look at the bottom row, the, uh, the, the very last thing at the bottom, it says jump to line and it also has like a search, te search text or search next in there. Um, it, it also uses regular expressions. So if you want to look up a particular asset, you can easily find it using this tool. Um, one of the things that I wanted to um, mention also is that I'm working hard with internally to see if we can make this publicly available on GitHub. Um, so, so once I, you know, get approval for that, I will let you know Niels and Mark know what's the status of that. But we found this to be very helpful also during our development um, to check for any inconsist inconsistencies between, for example, detail records and summary, rec and summary records and, and uh, just making sure that everything looks tight and proper and ready to go before we deliver it. And I think that's all I have. Okay, Zach, thank you very much indeed. Um, we're now gonna turn back to another licensor uh, in the form of David Butler from ICE Services. So David, over to you. Hi, thanks, Mark. Um, I'm. I kept mine relatively simple. I mean, I can only underline what other people have said. So the the, the detail of what that they've covered, I, I agree with. Um, for those who don't know, I saw a processing hub. We process um, on behalf of several major publishers, and also on behalf of our shareholders. That's PRS, Stim and Gamer, the UK, Swedish, and German PROs. So the first benefit was really sort of decommissioning any legacy formats that that, that, that existed there. Um, everything that has been said before, the reduced file sizes compared to XML, the, the faster processing time, there's sort of less room for interpretation compared to XML. These are all great benefits in the DSR. Um, things like standardizing the terminology in, in um, DSP proprietary formats, those kind of things. Relatively easy versioning of records. So if party A and party B want to exchange a field, but we don't need it, it's fair, it seems to be easy for us just to ignore it. Um, and new business models that come along, they seem to be relatively easily uh, catered for. I mean, there's some discussion goes on, but we usually, we usually get there in the end. Um, we have about 12 DSPs, I think, in our system who've reported in DSRF, different services. Um, 
three more i think planning to move actively planning to move many more sort of smaller companies sort of preparing test files that kind of thing it, it's version 1.2 of the dsrf is a standard format we send out in a kind of welcome pack um so that it's been relatively well received even companies who uh, would rather send an excel spreadsheet when they actually look at the dsr um they can usually produce one um, relatively easily so next slide is more about cdm so um yes we're going to produce cdm uh we want to do that in for usage in quarter one next year uh we've raised a change request so our it department know it's on their plate we've finished the detailed design and uh we're just waiting for a developer to free up to start building it um uh, phase one, we kind of divided it into two phases. So basic CDMs for pre and post usage uh, in quarter one, that might change, it might slip, but roughly early next year. Phase two, medium term, is looking at corrections, disputes, um, the auxiliary copyright fields, that's all kind of part of wider process. And uh, what do we do there? Do we, do, for, for corrections, um, do, how do we, do we automate that? Is it part of a new export tool we, we, we would use or disputes? Do we kind of ingest that into a BI tool or how do, how do we, how do we handle it? It's a bigger sort of process. Um, CDM compared to CCID, I, would, I don't know, about 85% of the fields are the same. So it's just a mapping exercise, but there are new fields in there. More transparency, I think we could say in CDM, which is, is, is fine, um, but it does mean um, some changes. Um, if we use an exchange rate, um, we provide that, but CDM provides the opportunity to say, which exchange rate did you use? We, we Our fin finance system knows that, but to populate Bundesbank or ECB into a field, we, we have to make some changes in, syst in the system. It's not major changes, but it's one challenge, bringing data in from different parts of our system into the export tables and, um, and allowing for the contractual, different contractual flavors. We have different customers, different DSPs, different contracts, different agreements. We'd like to sort of standardize it around uh, one flavor of CDM that, that we send out with, with some flexibility. So that's a kind of challenge um, and an opportunity. So I think that's it. For me. Okay, David, thank you very much indeed. And uh, last but by no means least, uh, Chris uh, Bly from Apple, over to you. Hey everyone. Uh, so yeah, quick introduction. I'm Chris. Uh, I work on the music publishing operations team and oversee uh, our external reporting uh, and work in the DSR workgroup VDEX. Uh, so some of the good implementation experiences that we've had is, uh, you know, partners like standards we find. Uh, there's a lot of cases where, you know, the good thing about DDEX is anyone can join. So everyone kind of gets their opportunity to give their input into the reporting format and it's not just something that you know is being put on top of uh licensors or even licensees to handle reporting to uh, in comparison to the older xml format so you know itunes launched back in 2001 we've been ddex member i think from like the get-go of DDEX. So we've implemented multiple versions of uh, DSR and XML was certainly one of the earlier uh, versions that we implemented. And in comparison to DSRF, it's it's much, uh, the DSRF flat file is much simpler to deal with and handle than XML. Uh, of course, I'm sure most of you know of XML, you're probably gonna need a parser to actually really kind of look through the file, understand the data in it. Um, and the nice thing about DSRF of how we implemented it is within the work group is that you can open it up in Excel and it's human readable. So it makes it much easier for testing aspects. So if your testers aren't uh, technical, you know, they can easily just open it up in Excel, look at the data, ensure that it looks accurate to what they're expecting to see. Uh, and it's definitely much easier to use as well as in comparison to XML, there's a huge drastic reduction in uh, file size alone. So in some of our files that I've kind of looked through in about a one gigabyte XML file, you'll be able to report roughly 450,000 resources, you know, give or take uh, 
what you're including in the data and everything. Whereas comparison to uh, a DSR file that is DSRF file that's one gigabyte, you know, you can report almost roughly four million resources. So you get almost a nine x increase in the amount of data that you're actually able to report in there, which is definitely helpful as uh, platforms have moved more to a streaming context, which certainly has a lot higher transaction and a lot more resources that are being utilized compared to the older download models. Um, so some of the challenges that we've seen is, you know, just getting it on the roadmap for development is difficult. There's definitely the aspect of, you know, it's not broken, why fix it? Uh, if you don't have that business need, why in, incorporate this? And I, this is definitely, I think, a two-way street. I see it as, you know, if you're going to implement a new version and you're a DSP, licensors may be like, yeah, we don't really, we don't have plans to implement it because we don't see it fitting our business needs necessarily. Uh, and the same can go for DSPs of, hey, well, you know, this version doesn't really change anything for how we're reporting. Why implement it? So there is definitely an aspect that you'll probably have to maintain multiple versions in some cases. I think licensors especially have to deal with this as you know, there's certain DSPs that will be on older versions, other DSPs will be eager to implement newer versions and so on. Uh, you know, standards move slower than the business as Zach kind of uh, brought up with, you know, some YouTube aspects is, you know, there's times where, you know, the business moves very quick but uh, the standard isn't there yet. Uh, an example of this that we had with Apple was when we were moving, as the work group was moving to create the flat file version of the DSR, uh, you know, Apple Music was launching and we didn't have a standard that besides XML to actually report the data in which XML was not really a method that we wanted to go towards for reporting the streaming service. Uh, so there's definitely times where you're, you, where you're gonna have to kind of you know, work out and come up with an intermittent solution to report your uh, reporting, to be able to meet your reporting uh, deadlines and everything due to the aspect of how the standards move compared to the business. Uh, another challenge is, you know, Zach also alluded to this is, it's not as simple for just take the standard and give that to your engineering team and have them develop it. Uh, there's definitely aspects of, you know, the definitions and terms that your engineers maybe use internally are not always going to match the same definitions and terms that uh, DDEX will use. Even though DDEX does kind of has defined a lot of the language and stuff like that, there's a lot of internal business knowledge of how something is referenced and an engineer may not always be knowledgeable of the business per se, but of more of the engineering aspects. So there's definitely kind of the translation aspect of taking the DDEX information and translating it into a way that your engineers can uh, develop and design the processes to be able to generate the reports that are necessary. Uh, one additional thing, so I, I didn't include this in my slides, but from a CDM implementation aspect, uh, we're still working on putting it into our roadmap uh, it's currently looking like probably end of uh, 2021 is when we'll kind of begin working on it and starting early in 2022 is when we'll probably begin to start utilizing CDM and accepting it from licensors. There's certainly aspects of, uh, you know, figuring out as we do utilize CCID, will we be able to have a mixed state of people delivering us CCIDs versus CC, CDM, uh, as it, there's certainly gonna be the case of not all licensors are gonna move at the same time. So it's it's still kind of open for us of when we'll be fully migrated to that, but uh, it's something that we're still looking into and planning to move to. And uh, that is all I had. Chris, uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, so we're coming into the final straight. Um, um, and if you haven't got the message so far that DSR and CDM are highly integrated, Niels is just going to summarize the points that have been made on that front. But before I do that, there was one question about um, the tool um, or the validator tool that DDEX has published a couple of years back for DSR. 
um, well, Google has developed them, um, DDEX has then published them as an open source library that everybody can download and play with. That one is actually a little bit um, outdated at the moment. I'm, or we are in the process of updating it to the current version of DSR and either at the same time or shortly thereafter, it will also be able to uh, validate CDM messages, um, CDM, CDM corrections, um, CDM discrepancies. And so that is coming. Um, the reason why I can promise that that is coming because, well, those two standards are actually made from the same cloth um, because they are made to work with one another. As I said earlier, the structure is the same, the terms used is the same, the way the individual cells are being set up, so the functionality of how those things work is the same. Um, it's the same architecture, technical framework, um, and the file naming convention, while not exactly the same, if you know the file naming convention of DSR, you will recognize the file naming convention of uh, of CDM because it's sender, recipient, date, time, um, and and a bit of information uh, about when the whole thing or about what the file is about um, in the form of DSR. It's the um, the, the service tier, whereas in, in in CDM it then says whether it's a CDM or a CDM. Um, correction or a discrepancy message and so forth. Um, the big thing though for me is the clear linking between DSR and CDM. Before we had CDM, I regu regularly received emails um, from people who had DSR messages and wanted to look at CCID in most cases, and they didn't know where to include actually the, the record number in the DSR standard, the sales transaction ID, where should that go in, in the CCID record? Um, different people had different views of that. Well, with DSR and CDM, there is only one way because the standard says very clearly where that link should go. Um, and it's the same linking mechanism between a DSR message and a CDM message as it is between a CDM message and a CDM discrepancy. Uh, report and a CDM discrepancy report and the uh, updated um, CDM correction. So all of these things are are looking like it's actually one standard. It's not two standards, but one standard with lots of parts. Um, and as I said earlier, CDM supports all the DSR profiles, with the exception of the financial reporting, which we shall um, gallantly ignore now. They both deal with multi-context and multi-content category, as long as both parties uh, support that. Um, they also apply, um, support this hybrid mode where the DSR does multi-context or is used in a multi-context way, whereas the CDM is, is then split into single context. That depends on how sender and recipient would like to play uh, the game. Um, that already speaks to the next point here that if you have one claim um, for multiple context, that can be done in one line or that can be done in one single message or it can be done in multiple CDM messages, depending on how you want to do that. Um, but that's all bilaterally agreeable. The standard is, is very flexible on that matter. I would expect that things start more single context and over time will grow into multi-context as data volumes will inevit inevitably grow and people's confidence in the standard and in their implementation of the standard will grow as well. That's it, I believe. Thank you, Niels. Um, and um, so this is a chance for uh, all of you uh, attending to ask any questions, um, if you have any. Uh, if you think of things after the webinar finishes, please feel free to email us at info at ddex.net. That comes to me and Niels, and um, uh, we will happily try and answer those. Um, so we have one question here. Um, 
what should be sent by the DSP in response to the CDM in order to communicate fulfilment of the claim? Could for, exa could, for example, the DSR royalty reporting profile be used? Um, I don't know whether the royalty, um, uh, the the um, the royalty reporting profile is the right approach at that stage. If everything is well, if if both parties agree that um, the the claims made and the invoice details are correct, um, the only thing that needs to follow is basically a check because what the CDM message provides you with is basically a, a, a bill of material. These are the items for which I claim and at the top of the of the CDM message you find the overall sum that is now due. So that can can, can be done um, through that mechanism. It's only I've, becomes yeah. interesting as, as soon as there are then um, discrepancies in which case there is a hence and forth uh, being, being Chris created. you want to say something yeah and Neil's kind of finished what I was going to add in was I was going to say generally after a DSP would receive a CDM if there are any discrepancies you would then send that information which generally most likely there will be in cases of overclaims across multiple licensors that's it's a rare case that that never happens so you'll definitely have uh, that case Assuming you're working with a licensor that is working off a basis that they don't pay over 100% on any claim or anything like that. Uh, but otherwise, I like I would agree. I don't think the royalty reporting profile would be accurate because that is more to specify, uh, like almost reporting to a publisher, especially give more like the U.S. context where uh, you're not giving a DSR file to a uh, to a publisher, you're generally saying, here's your statement of royalties and what we're reporting to you that would go through now soon to be to MLC, but previously HFA or MRI for mechanical royalties. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? In which case, um, I'd like to thank the representatives of the DDEX members who've um, helped with this webinar. Um, Unlike myself and Niels, they work at the coalface and have to deal with this stuff every day. So hopefully you have found um, the comments that they've provided helpful in in uh, in you to to uh, work for your own experiences as far as these standards are concerned. Um, and um, so we'd like to say thank you uh, for participating in the webinar, um, and um, we hope you found it helpful. Um, have a good whatever is left of the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.